So as uh, our devotion today is Psalm 102, uh, 25 verses 25 through 28. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away. But you are the same and for years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring spring shall be established before you. So definitely um, sort of a, a premonition or a thought about where we're headed and what we need to rely on and look towards, um, especially as we go through these uh, traumatic times with the, with the pandemic going on. So does anyone have any uh, thoughts about this particular verse? All right, so um, just uh, administrative items. I think you can have all see these on Canvas. Um, but um, tonight, the quiz on Chapter 10 and 11 is due. The um, implementation was the screenshots showing or basically evidence of what you've uh, accomplished. Uh, and your work activity log is due on Wednesday. Friday, we have the quiz on Chapter 12, Software Support and Maintenance. And then your last quiz, which is uh, on Monday, is the uh, quiz on Software and Application Development Agreements. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that, the, that those will be fairly straightforward and easy quizzes and hopefully some easy points for you. Wednesday, April 29th. Is another work activity log. It's just a log, no, no longer needing screenshots and evidence of prog progress because uh, you'll be finishing up. And then Wednesday, April 29th is your promo video or project presentation. And so that's sort of a demonstration of your software or a uh, amusing commercial or advertisement for the features of your software um, is another approach that some students have done to try to um, make it fun. And then uh, Friday, May 1st is the test plan and report. It's basically a plan of some key features of your software that you decided that you're gonna do a test plan for. You write down all the different scenarios that you're gonna go through the test and what the expected outcomes are. And then you actually do a report based on um, executing that plan and and seeing how how your software does against that plan so it's just uh, for some key features in your software not an exhaustive uh, test plan but just get to give you a feel of what it is to create a test plan and test report something that um, I'm guessing that you will have the opportunity to, to do when you are in the workforce it was definitely a common thing uh, that I had to do quite a bit of, and um, being able to do it well and efficiently was important in my career. So any questions about the coming attractions for the class? So the thought is it would be nice to give, um, actually um, present them in class, but we do have quite a few classes, so I'm not sure whether we can pull that off, uh, but that would be um, a fun thing to do, I think, for uh, you to share what you did with your fellow students. But we'll see how that work pans out. So, um, the next topic is a topic that in the past I've gone into a little bit more detail, but I certainly will plan to go into a lot more detail in the Software Engineering 2 class, but that's the concept of design patterns. Has has any of you um, had ex any experience or heard of design patterns? Yeah, the capstone class has directed us to know an awful lot about them. Oh, really? 
That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Just so I came and, and asked about it. Yeah, he and just so expected us to know something. From it. And and in what context was was that brought up? The context was do this assignment, use the visitor pattern. You know what that is, right? Cool. Really? I did not. Yeah, that's when I came um, a while back and was asking about the visitor pattern and trying to get some resources on it. Wow, you were actually using the visitor pattern in the capstone class without ever having it covered at all? Yep. So did you get the information that's, you needed, Jason? Because that is not an easy pattern. I've used it before. Um, yeah, no, I spent I spent a couple of hours on it and then gave up and tried to implement another reason and then gave up entirely and dropped the class. Really? <laughs> yep, and this... So, so remind what me what the capstone class is. Is that actually... That's not a CS class, right? Program translation. No, program translation. Oh. It's the capstone CS class. And that's what happens when only slight offense to them. Neither of my advisors felt it necessary to tell me the fact that I was attempting to register for a capstone class. Wow. So, and so that's interesting because... Times. Yeah. Um, I would... I would consider the the visitor pattern one of the more complicated design patterns. So interesting. That's I good to know. Agree. Well, um, I could probably walk you through it, although it's been it's been a while since I used the visitor pattern. I actually did but use it in a piece of code, but um, we'll I'll elaborate that and as we go and through. Then refactored it out. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, I did tell that story, didn't yes. I? So anyway, this is the designs pattern of the book. It was um, a book by these gentlemen here. And basically, their observation was that there were common problems in, in computer science and in programming that need to be solved. And what they found was that there were some best practices or patterns of coding that can be used to solve those those problems that kept coming up over and over and over uh, in programs. And so the concept there was to take the best of those patterns or uh, programming practices for for those common situations and solidify them, give them names, and allow and put them out there in a in in a book um, so that we can use them. Uh, in in our code um, and there actually is a, a bunch of really good books on it this is the original like I said design patterns elements of reusable object oriented software um, but um, I've ne actually never used it myself but I had a coworker that um, when he was tasked to learn design patterns uh, as one of his growth areas he found this book on design patterns for uh, computer game for gaming for comp writing computer games. And he said that, that that was really well written and easy to follow and had some very good examples. So even though he wasn't actually doing uh, games, he actually found it useful. I haven't looked at it myself and I don't even recall what the title of the book is, but there is a design pattern book on um, games. There's also certainly design pattern books uh, on web development, EJB and, and the like. So anyway, um, there are various um, categories of design patterns. Uh, they're, they're grouped. Um, and so uh, they, the groupings are creational, structural, and behavioral are the three design pattern categories so in terms of creational uh you have the abstract factory which is creating an instance of several family of classes and the impetus here is that you don't when you're creating an instance of the class there is meta information that actually determines what class it is that you're actually using when you instantiate this uh, class from the abstract factory and, and basically you just know the basic interface, but you don't know the actual implementation that there is some data or information, uh, metadata or configuration data that determines what actual 
um, class is instantiated. So this is used when, for instance, let's say you have different hardware or um, maybe a different database and you're interfacing to that different hardware and interface and you want to hide the fact from the developer which particular class that they need to use for the hardware or for the database that you're using. And so you would actually instantiate the class through the abstract factory. The abstract factory would then determine which class to instantiate. Other tools are builders. It separates object construction from its actual representation. So this is um, how the building object is built up. The factory me method, which creates instances of several derived classes, very similar to the abstract factory. Um, and, but basically it is from a class hierarchy that it's being built, the class is being built. An object uh, pool, uh, this is um, a pattern that those of you in my operating system class will see that's familiar, is that you have a pool of objects and um, you want to avoid the expensive creation process of creating that object and so um, and configuring it possibly and so that you actually keep a pool of them available that are already created that you use and then when you're done with you return back to the free pool. We have the clone pattern which is a fully initialized instance uh, that can be copied or cloned. And so you could think of this as a useful way to, um, for instance, record state. And uh, that actually is a behavioral pattern that we'll see later. But basically the clone is uh, keeping or keeping a copy of uh, another copy of an object, including it all its uh, properties, property values and state. Uh, the singleton class is a class of which only one instance of that class can exist in the system. This is very, very common uh, for use in uh, managers that are managing uh, particular areas that you want to have only one class be in charge or one instance of a class be in charge. If you have multiple of them, then you have uh, places for um, mis- of the different classes getting out of sync and uh, the behaviors not being controlled properly. So um, those are the, some of the uh, creational patterns that uh, most common creational patterns that you will see. Um, does anyone have any questions about those particular uh, patterns or what they? Um, not specific to the patterns, but just something it reminded me of pertaining to operating systems. Um, are we going to look at threading or thread safety in any more detail in OS? Um, probably not, other than in your final, in the final for that class. Was there okay. something specific? Well, we can we can talk about this after class since this is an OS topic. But um, no, it's yeah. just a just a general topic that I was interested in learning a bit more. So just yeah, curious. yeah, certainly uh, learning more about threading and thread safety is something that you should definitely be a student of and get practice in. So look, getting practice problems in that area is would be valuable tool to have in your tool belt for sure. Um, so actually, let's kind of go through let's see if i can bring up the whiteboard this won't unfortunately show up in the recording but um let's see well maybe i won't go into singleton pet has, has, has anyone seen what a uh, um code for a singleton pattern in pattern typically looks like has anyone when had any familiar or seen code it is a very very common pattern so if you've looked at someone else's code you may you very likely will have seen it okay yeah i don't anyway 
So generally what it is, is you'll have an if block and you'll basically have a static class variable. Um, so for instance, in Java, you will have a static class variable and um, it, it, the value of it will be initially set to null. And then you'll have actually um, the constructor of the class would be private so that um, you can't instantiate that class from anywhere else except for that class. And then you create a, a method called um, something like get instance, uh, which is also a static method that you call. And when you call it, it does basically a lazy loading situation or lazy creation situation where when you call the get instance, if the value of that static variable that that references that class type um, or stores that class type, when you call the get instance, it says if it's null, then we create one and return that value. If the value is not null, then we just hand that value back. So in that case, then you're assured that there will only be one instance because the only one who can create that, the only method that can create that are methods that are local to that class. And um, when you have one that already exists and the method for getting an instance of it is called, you, you get the one that's already created if one hasn't been created already. Um, but otherwise, um, it must be the first time. So that first instance is created and um, then used by everybody so that you're always using the same instance of that class. So that's the general pattern of w the way that is generally coded uh, in Java, for instance. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? I, um, I could go searching for the whiteboard uh, to actually illustrate that code, but I'm, I'm yeah. hoping that I described it as well. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering, would that just create a new instance though? Like every time you said get instance? No, because every time you call get instance, you're do actually doing an if to see if the oh, okay. static variable has an instance. I mean, uh, you've created something and stored it in that static variable. So if it's already been created, you wouldn't create a new one. You would actually right. hand back the one that's been created. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. That's cool. So. Yeah, I'd have to probably look a little more in depth in the specific implementation, but the concept makes sense. Just if Good. one's already been created, hand it back. Right. If not, exactly. create it and then hand it back. So that way you only ever have one instance running. Right. If you if you look it up on Wikipedia, it gives you like a little bit of code. And I was right. like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Right, right. So if you look it up in <laughs> Wikipedia or in design pattern book or documentation, yes, it would be uh, very straightforward, um, hopefully. Um, so a common question uh, that uh, people will ask me is, uh, why not just use a static class, right? Uh, if you're going to only I have one instance of it. Objects. Yes. Might and that to is... Store data a, even if it doesn't need to store different data. Right. So that is a, a valid question that certainly you could use uh, a static class where, where you only have... Um, the class methods, reasons that you might not want to do it is, for instance, if you, when you're lazy loading it, there could be cases where that particular manager is not used unless you use a particular part of the software. The other more typical reason for doing it that way rather than a static class is that if you ever decide to make it not a uh, a singleton class and that you need more than one or something or need to change it so that it's an instance rather than static, the process of converting it can be a, a little bit messy and a little bit work and could be error prone. Uh, but certainly those reasonings, reasons are diminished with the uh, powerful, the features that come with IDEs that allow you to refactor that more easily and not have to do that by hand. But that typically has been stated as the reason for doing it in that particular way. So you will commonly see that just um, as a matter of practice. It's become such common practice to do it that way. 
I'd imagine there'd still be cases where you may need to have something that only has one instance allowed, but you still need to be able to deal with changing variables and changing attributes of it. Which would be more yes. difficult to do with a static class if they're not hard coded. Right. You are limiting yourself to that and and certainly um, choosing to make a class static is not a decision that be, should be taken lightly for that exact reason. Yes. So you do have a lot more flexibility in this scheme. So some of the structural patterns are the adapter pattern. So this is um, that you have different classes that um, that you're interfacing to, and there's a mismatch in um, the the implementations or the API for each. And so this is a way to adapt using an adapter to make the interfaces match of these different classes. Common situations where you'll see something like this would be a system where you're actually taking multiple pieces of software and put or, or subsystems and putting them together from possibly different sources, um, like a different group in the, in the same company or from a different company and a library. So the adapter class uh, adapts the interface of one class to match the standard interface of the rest of the system, for instance, or the home system that you're importing this, this software into. So it's a way of adapting the interfaces. Bridges are um, bridges from one implementation to another. Um, again, separating the interface from its implementation so that you have um, this bridge uh, piece of software that um, can adapt to different implementations and hide the different implementations from the user. Composite is a tree structure of simple and comp composite objects. So this is a, a way of handling uh, a general tree where you don't actually have to know about the different objects and in fact can have different um, class objects in this tree. Uh, the decorator is adding responsibility to the objects dynamically. The name decorator comes from the fact that this is commonly used in user interfaces where you want to be able to add different uh, display properties dynamically to objects. So um, that's where the decorator pattern comes in. The facade is a single class that re represents an entire subsystem. So this is an interface that abstracts away the complications of a subsystem so that the users of that subsystem don't have to know about the details that it's been um, hidden behind this, this set of classes, uh, class or classes that um, abstracts away the whole subsystem to be a, a nice, easy model from which to work with. Um, fly, fly weight. Um, is for sharing. It's a fine grain instance sharing mechanism. So it's uh, sharing of resources or um, classes and instances. Uh, so it's an efficient uh, sharing mechanism. And then um, private class data, which is accessor and mutator access. Those are methods that you're probably familiar with, with gets and sets and things like that. Um, using control access to restricted data uh, within a class. Um, so various variants of that. Um, and then we have the proxy, which is an object that represents another object. And uh, I'm sure, I don't know if you've any of you have taken uh, Dr. Gowan's networking class, but uh, networking is a prime example where you will actually have a proxy object representing another object in some other domain. Um, common places of this is uh, remote procedure calls, right? This would be an example of that. Or um, like SOAP, the application, the um, programming application protocol where you can call um, methods remotely across the network. These are all places in networking where um, proxy objects are heavily used. To 
take a look at my notes here. So yeah, so basically the object for the proxy is a, a surrogate for some other more complex object or remote object. Design patterns we ha uh, for behavioral, we have a lot of um, design patterns for uh, behavioral. One is the chain of responsibility, which is uh, passing events to a list of handlers uh, in other objects. And so you're, you're delegating the responsibility uh, through a chain of uh, basically a list of handlers that handle that. Um, again, a very common sol solution in uh, UI design and web design. So you will see that, but also um, in real time, op real time uh, applications, I have seen that quite used quite a bit as well in my uh, development of real time systems. So just a way to pass the the responsibility to a series of different objects that implement a uh, particular interface. Um, command is encapsulating a command request as an object. So you could imagine this would be a very useful way to um, parse a particular language and interpret it and send it to as a command to, to somewhere else. Um, that this object actually represents a particular command and actually creating a um, application language, a language uh, that sort of matches what your application is doing and your user's application space is a very common way to implement uh, functionality is to create this language and then have these various commands being encapsulated uh, as objects. And then you instantiate those objects when when you parse the language and come across that object, you then, then uh, delegate it to these command objects. Uh, interpreter is a way to basically interpret the, the language. So it's, it's a structure for interpreting the language. Uh, you can see that interpreting and command objects would be very closely related. related. Iterators is a way to um, iterate through um, objects in a list, for instance, or some type of uh, data structure. Uh, you have, I'm sure, seen this. And iterators are now such a common um, design pattern that it is actually uh, provide it as a feature of, of most modern programming languages as well. A uh, mediator is just a way to simplify communication between classes that you have a me mediator that st stands in between to simplify the communication. It takes care of handing the intricacies of the communication between the classes and handles that, com that complication to um, make the other classes simpler because it removes some of that complication. Um, Memento. Memento is capturing and storing an object's internal state. Um, and this is very, very nice for situations where, um, let's say you want, want the state that your software is running on to be saved in a way that when you quit the program and restart the program, that state uh, can be captured. And so um, so that they can, the user can continue from where they left off and not have to get back to where they were, that the state um, is restored. And, and this is, um, I'm sure you've seen this in applications that you've used and, and maybe even applications that you've written. Um, that the internal state of the objects when you quit are restored. Uh, those of you who have um, that are doing gaming software can certainly recognize this as something of value is um, being able to store the state of the system. So where would be another instance be beyond just shutting down the system where you could imagine uh, capturing the state of an object at a particular moment in time could be useful. Does anyone else have any ideas? I have 
one in mind. Ever had word crash while writing an essay? Yeah. So a crash situation. Constantly save the state. Right. So that you can Seems restore like a it. Good idea. Yeah, and Word in fact does that, right? So what else? So does anyone recognize what the uh, keyboard shortcut Control Z is? It stands for undo. Actions, I would assume. Yeah, undo. It so you want like to undo the action. More of a stack of previous actions. Right. And how would you? And how would you actually go back to the previous state? So I guess you could either save the state or try to save and revert the actions, but either one would work. Yes. So that would be a common way to provide undo capability would be um, a memento pattern. But yes, the other one is you could you could have a list of commands, right? Using the command um, design pattern that you execute it and then have a reverse of each of those commands that you could go back through that chain and undo them uh, by going through the process of doing them in the reverse order. Exactly. So that would be the command pattern would probably be uh, enlisted in, in that kind of a scheme. Uh, null object captures and restores an object internal state. Uh, I haven't actually used that myself, but um, it's basically falling back to a de default behavior is the null objects, um, is, is the default behavior. That would be the null behavior um, observer is um, a way of notifying changes to a number of classes. Again, um, something that uh, is common in UI design, it's a list of objects that are interested in a change of state of a particular object. So one of the things that you could imagine is that if you had a UI widget and you clicked on it or moved a slider bar, there may be a list of objects that are interested in the change of the state. That the slider bar was moved up or the slider bar was moved down. There could be multiple objects that all have to um, react to that. For instance, you could change the color of the background of the screen, and then there could be another class that's interested in, oh, that means that we're gonna fire off some electronics or change the temperature or whatever the case may be. There may be a list of objects that are constantly observing this state, a particular state of a particular object. So that would be an observer pa pattern. Uh, the state pattern is uh, basically the uh, idea of a finite state machine for a class. So again, we've gone through what a state machine is. I talked about how it's useful for uh, workflow, but there are multiple different cases where you would want to actually implement the, the state um, that the states that the object goes through um, directly in the code in some uniform pattern. And again, I s mentioned that there were frameworks that actually implement that pattern to make it easier and not have to reinvent the wheel that you can use this framework that will implement the state pattern for you. Um, so strategy uh, is encapsulating an algorithm inside of a class. Um, I think that's pretty straightforward in that the algorithm is contained and owned by a class. And then we have the template me method, which defers the exact steps of an algorithm to some subclass. And, and that is um, sort of the a method to take it, uh, a, a design pattern to take that method um, and defer the actual exact steps of the algorithm to um, an inherit class, a class that inherits from the parent. So again, it's um, a, a common uh, object-oriented pattern that you use that you may not have even realized had a name. So this um, provides us with a vocabulary that we can use that other people will understand when we do these techniques. A lot of these techniques we just 
inherently do because it seems natural. And that is um, a good thing because um, we do want to um, be able to to speak about these in in terms in terms that um, other people will know uh, to give us a common vocabulary so that you don't have to uh, spend a lot of time trying to describe what we're doing. Um, and then the visitor pattern, which uh, Jason was talking about. Uh, so the visitor pattern is a double dispatch mechanism. Uh, and the, and then the double dispatch mechanism is executed in such a way that it appears to the user of the pattern um, that it's a single dispatch. Um, and it really is a pattern base you can kind of gather from the name. It's where an object goes through and calls various methods um, not various methods, a particular method of all these different classes that implement this interface, and you're actually executing that method. And that method, when it gets visited, so you're visiting a bunch of classes, a class that goes walking through a bunch of different classes, executing this method, and then the actual uh, class itself that, that got visited is then responsible for determining what the current state is and what its behavior should be. So you actually take this class and go visiting all these other classes by calling this standard method um, as, a, as a visitor pattern. And then like Jason said, uh, I've actually mentioned that I um, use a visitor pattern uh, in a particular class, but then later refactored it because I had more knowledge about uh, the system that the, visit, that the visitor pattern assumes and that I could actually simplify it. But um, the visitor pattern is um, a way to do it. Um, so Jason, did you have access to the design pattern book or d were you able to find, there's uh, generally PDFs available online of the design pattern um, and tutorials? Um, you provided a couple um, pages of it, which I read through. But it wasn't illustrated like enough. The, no, it's like the general the general idea kind of makes sense looking through that. Um, Dr. Boss just used um, analogies of it. Right, I found like I just did there. <laughs> very few. Yeah, but like that was at least sort of a description. I found very few cases where the general analogies for... CS concepts actually help. Like I probably was given 20 or 30 different analogies of how inheritance works. It's like, oh, well, this is animal and this is two legs. So now it is a person and four and now in a dog and all this stuff and never had a clue what it was talking about. Right. It was too abstract. Actually looked at the implementation. Yeah, it would oh, be nice to actually yeah, have makes sense. some type of example, huh? To to actually see what they mean with an example. And um, I actually have in my office uh, the Design Patterns book. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, it, I <laughs> haven't been back to campus since the close, so I don't have it at my disposal. Um, but I guess I did send you a clip of it. And did they, did they actually have an example of that in, in the, what I sent you or not really? It just, sort of, again, a, a vague description instead of code. I believe they had a couple of coding examples. The main problem was that we were, so the task was to initially build a syntax tree, and then we were supposed to use the visitor to go through and actually parse out and display the syntax in like a broken down way. Mm -hmm. It's like I didn't fully understand what the actual intent was and then i didn't and, at all and how the and how, how we the visitor pattern would help that. i guess too yeah so i spent a long time just trying to figure out how the visitor pattern worked and couldn't get as far as actually getting a working implementation and then eventually reached out and see looked if i could drop the requirement for 
um, that yeah. specific implementation. Yeah, I actually got through the process and was actually able, able to implement the code, but the code was so complicated that that's when I started thinking, how can I refactor this? Because I, I basically put in my comments that this is the visitor panel I'm doing and tried to describe what, what it was I was doing. And then I'm looking at it going, this is going to be a real bear to maintain. <laughs> and that's when I, I thought about the problem again and, and decided to refactor it, even though I used one of these um, patterns that are, have a name and are sanctioned. It was just a little bit too complicated for me. And I did think about ways to do it. So again, um, these are patterns and, and solutions that people have come up for solving these common problems, but is not a reason to, to turn off your brain and think about other ways to do things. Uh, so definitely take that with a grain of, of salt, the design patterns. It's, it's a good uh, set of terms in order to, to refer to common problems and common solutions. Um, and it's a good starting point to solve problems, but it's not the only way. And that has been one of the detractions against design patterns is that it encourages people to, to use it as a menu of this will solve all my problems. I just go through this book and find one that kind of fits and we just stuff it in there. You want to make sure that you choose design patterns that fit well. And if it doesn't fit well, then maybe the design pattern is not the solution from the design pattern is not the correct solution. So you always have to keep that in mind. So indeed. Let's pick a team. Um, Did we do the uh, checker simulator team? Did they give me their status update? We did, yes. Yeah, we did. yeah, we did. Okay. Uh, so, and we did the image encryption team. So how about the gravity shoot team? So where uh, are going, you in your system, in your project? It's going pretty good. Um, I've been working on a level switcher. So that way, like when they get to the end level, uh, they can go into other levels. And then once that's finished, I'm going to start making multiple levels because pretty much all that will be left. I also okay. just recently bought a program that lets me make pixel art and animate it. So I'm going to be trying to use that for the animations. And so what process model would you say you used as you went through the development of your um, Gravity Shoot game? Uh, I said probably waterfall. So you actually did go straight through from requirements and and didn't do much iteration at all then. Uh, no, not to my knowledge. Okay, interesting. I would have guessed that you might have been following a little bit more of a agile process, where you you're doing sprints, getting something to work kind of, and then and then okay, now where are we going to take it from there and do a new implementation? But it was pretty. Pretty straightforward waterfall. And, and that can be the case where your application is straightforward enough, or if you have experience in that area uh, previously and already know where some of the pitfalls might be, uh, those are cases where the waterfall model could quite uh, possibly work well. So um, good. All right. Um, so any other status information you want me to know about uh, your project? Uh, nothing comes to mind. It's mostly just setting up the levels now and getting the graphics to look good. Yeah, well, good. So I'm looking forward to seeing a demo of your, your software, of your game. Uh, so we did image encryption. We did Money Munchie. So how about the uh, racing team? Um, yeah, it's uh, going good. We... Uh, we're just running into a few problems on uh, sort of artistic things, mm -hmm. like exactly how we want it to look and the kind of styling. 
functionally, it's we're getting there. Right. We've got a decent prototype going. Good. And so, Isaac, what kind of model would you say that you'd use for developing process model for your for your approach to creating the program? I don't know if I could name the right model. So describe the steps that you took in, in formulating your solution. We kind of, we thought through what we wanted to do and just every time we met, we would just tackle a different problem. Maybe fix up some of the previous ones if they weren't working the way we wanted. Right. Okay. So yeah, I, I'm seeing probably a little bit of sprint kind of discussions you get together see what's working see what's not so working so well and then regroup and decide what you're going to work on so that has a lot of of the the agile kind of processes and and um scrum kind of feel to it uh you probably you know being a team of two aren't doing a full scrum uh but uh you're using some elements of that technique sounds good uh and then the um did we just, I think did we discuss the with the roguelike uh, builder team did you guys um, give a status update on your project we did really early on right I think you were like one of the beginning ones so racing team money munchy image encryption so I think that's all the teams have had a chance to give a status update well great um so with that I'm gonna go ahead and ask for you have any questions we're just going to go ahead and wrap things up um here now um so any questions uh, about the class or what's going forward or um i guess design patterns i like could try to address them but uh um they can get quite deep um, but we can i can try to help you if you have any questions about design patterns but just know that they exist and and that we will we will discuss them in in more detail in software engineering too i'm sure so any questions so i i think i might have some surprises for the midterm so um i i, I mean not, not for the midterm for the final good surprises or bad surprises i think it's going to be a good surprise for most of you um yeah i i'm hoping it's going to be a reward because uh like i told you at the beginning of the semester i've been very impressed with you guys as a class of students uh very engaged um really taking the material to heart and um you know certainly you need more practice using some of the the information and the techniques but i have been greatly impressed so um I, I'm sure it will be a good surprise in terms of what we're going to do for the final. Cool. Yeah. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. If you'd like to stay and chat,